This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may include descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Do you remember how Alice wasn't always in Wonderland? She fell down, down, down deep in a hole. Right, well, I wasn't always in room. I'm like Alice. I was a little girl named Joy, and I lived in a house with my mom and my dad. You would call them grandma and grandpa. What house? A house. It was in the world. And there was a backyard, and we had a hammock. We would swing in the hammock, and we would eat ice cream. A TV house? No, Jack, a real house, not TV. When I was a little older, when I was 17, but there was a guy, he pretended his dog was sick. What's the dog's name? Jack, there wasn't a dog. He was trying to trick me, okay? He put me in his garden shed. Here, room is the shed. The clip you just heard is from a recent movie titled Room. It tells the fictional story of a girl who was kidnapped and kept hidden in a backyard shed for years. She gives birth to her son while imprisoned. In that clip, she is trying to make him understand that there is a whole world beyond the room they live in. He has never seen the outside of the four walls where he was born. While this movie is fiction, it is based on unbelievable but true events. But first... Imagine for a moment that a loved one of yours goes missing. What do you do? First, you might try and explain it away. They got delayed. They made a detour and forgot to call. You're sure everything is fine. Then, as time ticks away, you grow more concerned. Perhaps you make some phone calls, drive around or scout the area where they should be, ask a few people to look also, but then panic begins to set in. The police are called. A search is organized, and the media is alerted. But imagine this continues for hours. The hours turn into days. Days to weeks, weeks to months, and even years. And still, you have no answers. Some may give up hope, start the grieving process. This is certainly understandable, although heartbreaking. But what if you just can't ever give up hope, and you just keep looking and believing they will someday come home? In this series, I will share stories of people who went missing, for months, for years, and even for decades. Their families, for the most part, never gave up hope, and miraculously, their prayers were answered. And as you will learn, it really was a miracle that they ever came home at all. You'll find out how they were taken, how they were kept hidden away, and just how they were finally discovered. Please join me over the next few episodes as I take you through three high-profile abduction cases and their aftermath in the first Once Upon a Crime series, Lost and Found. Chapter 1, J.C. Lee Dugard. June 10, 1991, South Lake Tahoe, California. J.C. Lee Dugard, 11 years old, was in her last weeks of fifth grade. On this day, she woke as usual to get ready for school. Her mom, Terry, has already left for work. She peeks in on her sleeping 18-month-old sister, Shayna. J.C. doesn't see her stepfather, Carl, but believes he must be outside somewhere. She eats breakfast quickly and gets ready to set out up the road to the school bus, wearing her favorite outfit, pink stretch pants and a matching shirt with a kitty printed on it. South Lake Tahoe straddles the border of Nevada and California. The town is named for the lake it borders. Lake Tahoe spans 22 miles across with 72 miles of shoreline. It is a tourist spot in the summer with beaches, water skiing, boating and rental cabins, and in the winter with world-class ski resorts. The rest of the year, it is a quaint town of only 25,000 residents. It is inhabited by long-term locals, mostly middle class, looking for a safe and peaceful place to work and raise their families. J.C.'s mother, Terry, and stepfather, Carl Probin, moved with J.C. from Anaheim, California, just nine months before, after having vacationed there the previous year. They fell in love with the beautiful pine forests and sighted the mountains and the clean air as a place where the kids would be safe. J.C. is walking away from her house, thinking about the upcoming water park field trip at the end of the school year, thinking about things that are typical for an 11-year-old. She is shy and self-conscious about her body and is a little nervous about wearing a swimsuit in front of the whole class. She wants to talk to her mom about her concerns. Her mind wanders as she walks down the pine tree-lined road and uphill toward the bus. 
40-year-old Philip Garrido and his 36-year-old wife Nancy were scouting the Lake Tahoe area when they saw a pretty little blonde girl. Philip had spent the previous weeks and months preparing for this day. Now he saw his opportunity. Philip had a long history of drug use, sexual deviance, violence, and bizarre behavior. He played the guitar and had spent some time in the Lake Tahoe area in his early 20s, playing bars and casino lounges in a rock band. He fancied himself a rock star, but his erratic behavior due to his binge drinking and use of drugs, he took anything and everything, pot, cocaine, LSD, barbiturates. It got him kicked out of groups when his bandmates could no longer tolerate his craziness. They put up with his over-the-top pornography obsession and his preference for very young girls, even nicknaming him Filthy Phil. They would also put up with his lecturing about God and the Bible. During this time, he started talking about a black box he invented that allowed him to hear other people's thoughts. But when his binging on drugs and sex started causing him to miss important gigs, they'd finally had enough and asked him to leave the band. In 1976, Garrido moved to Reno, Nevada. He rented a storage unit a few blocks from his home. He set it up to be used as a recording studio, soundproofing the unit with large blankets on the walls and bringing in speakers and amps, but he had other intentions for the mini warehouse. First, he staged pornographic movie showings and invited other musicians and locals he'd met to come and party with him. Most were turned off by the hardcore nature of the movies he liked, as well as his over-the-top behavior during the parties. He would jump around and make extreme comments, sexual and violent in nature, about what he was watching and what he'd like to do the girls on the screen. Garrido soon set his next plan in action. In June 1976, Garrido kidnapped and raped a 19-year-old girl. She managed to escape and refused to press charges. Then five months later, in South Lake Tahoe, Katie Calloway, a 25-year-old mother of a 7-year-old, was making a quick stop at a convenience store before going to meet her boyfriend. As she was backing out of the parking lot, Philip Garrido tapped on her window and told her his car wouldn't start. Could she please give him a ride just up the road to a friend's house? He then directed her to a place where, too late, Katie realized was an empty lot. Before she could think, he grabbed the keys out of the ignition and slammed her head into the steering wheel. While still reeling from the blow and the shock, Garrido quickly lifted her into the passenger side of the car and handcuffed her, ducking her head below the dashboard and covering her with a blanket. He then began to drive her car and told her if she cooperated, he'd take her home later. An hour and a half later, Garrido led the terrified girl into his storage unit in Reno, which he'd equipped with a dirty mattress, colored spotlights, and a projector. For the next five hours, Garrido alternately took drugs and raped the girl. Around 2.30 a.m., a police officer on patrol noticed the girl's car parked in front of the unit with out-of-state plates and became suspicious. He banged on the door, and Garrido came to speak to the officer, warning the girl not to make a sound. While Garrido was trying to explain to the officer why he was in the storage unit at such an odd hour, Katie ran out screaming to the officer for help. Garrido, incredibly, tried to explain this away, telling the officer that Katie was his girlfriend. Noticing how terrified the young woman was, the officer arrested Garrido. Garrido was tried and convicted of kidnapping and rape and was sentenced to 50 years to life in prison. While incarcerated in Leavenworth Prison, Garrido met Nancy Bocanegra, a 25-year-old niece of a cellmate, and married her in 1981. Garrido convinced a prison psychologist that he had found God and had turned his life around. The psychologist cited him as a good candidate for rehabilitation. He was released from prison in 1988, only 11 years into his 50-year sentence and only three years before his next kidnapping. Lost in thought, J.C. first noticed the car when it pulled up beside her. The driver, a male, rolled the window down and J.C. assumed he must be wanting directions. Before she can barely finish this thought, a hand reaches out towards her and she only has a split second to see a black object coming towards her. She feels her body tingling and a loss of control as she falls. Trying to push herself backwards into the safety of the bushes behind her, she realizes she is not in full control of her limbs. Nancy has used a stun gun on the 80-pound girl. As if in a dream state, J.C. feels herself being lifted and then pitched into the car with a heavy blanket or cloth placed over her. 
She cannot see where she is or who has taken her, and she struggles to breathe under the heat of the blanket. JC loses consciousness on the floor of the back seat of the car. She has been abducted by strangers. Her stepfather, Carl, heard JC scream and rushed from the garage to see his stepdaughter grabbed by a dark haired woman and thrown into the back of the car. In a panic, he jumps on a nearby bicycle, trying to catch up to the car. As it speeds away, he shouts to neighbors to call 911. Children who are boarding the school bus just up the road from JC's house have seen the kidnapping as well. It will haunt many of them for years, having watched their classmate abducted by strangers in broad daylight. Nancy and Philip Grito drive their captive 160 miles south to Antioch, California. Philip and Nancy live with his mother, Patricia, and her husband, Herschel Franzen. The Franzen's home is located on a quiet residential street on the outskirts of the town. The homes all sit on large lots, with their backyard lot encompassing almost a full acre of land. Once again, Garrido has carefully planned and constructed where he will take his victim. Garrido has divided the backyard into two parts, erecting an eight-foot fence and planting a line of shrubbery, creating a backyard within a backyard. He also built a 10-foot by 10-foot soundproof shed and a primitive outhouse and shower, running cables from the house for electricity. This is where Philip Grito took 11-year-old J.C. Dugard that day. Keeping a blanket over her so she couldn't see where she was taken, he led her through the gate to the second backyard and into the soundproof shed. Naked now and handcuffed, he left her there alone, telling her that she would not be able to escape the locked doors, but even if she could, there were guard dogs who would attack her if she tried. Alone, terrified, cold and hungry, J.C. had only her abductor to depend on for food, water, heat, light, and company. Over the next week, in the way child predators often groom their victims, he came every day to bring her fast food, talk to her, and alternately threaten her. J.C. later reports that she was so lonely for any human contact that she sometimes looked forward to his visits. It was after a week of keeping the girl completely helpless and dependent on him for her very survival that Garrido began to rape her. Like many rape victims, and especially those as young and inexperienced as J.C. was, the experience was terrifying, confusing, painful, and surreal. She survived by using the coping mechanism known as dissociation, or a breaking off of the mind from the body. J.C. could ignore what was happening to her physically, by using her mind to take her to another place during the abuse. Some describe it as an out-of-body experience that helps you to maintain your sanity under horrific conditions. For the next 18 months, J.C.'s whole world was contained within that backyard shed and another small outbuilding next to it that her kidnapper had set up like a small apartment for himself. This is where he will bring her when he wants to binge on drugs and sex. After a few months, he allows her to be released from the handcuffs because he can trust her now, he says. Weeks later, Nancy is introduced to her and incredibly takes on a caretaker slash warden slash mother role. Eighteen months after her initial captivity, J.C. is allowed in the backyard where she can finally see the sun and feel fresh air. He has now renamed her Alyssa and will not allow her to use her real name again. In early 1992, about six months into J.C.'s abduction, Philip's stepfather died, leaving the house to his widow, Philip's mother, Patricia. Around this time, Philip introduced his mother to J.C., or Alyssa, as his and Nancy's daughter. In 1993, J.C. has been held captive by the Garritos for two years. Phil Garrido, still required to submit to drug testing as a condition of his parole, fails the test and is sent to jail for one month. During this time, Nancy takes over seeing to J.C. and guaranteeing that she can't escape. It's Easter 1994, and J.C. has been missing for 34 months. Her mother and the community have not forgotten her and continue to search and look for new leads with no luck. On this day, both Nancy and Philip come to visit J.C. and bring her home-cooked food 
instead of just fast food as always. They also bring her an Easter basket. They then tell her that they need to talk to her about something. They tell her that they think she may be pregnant. She is stunned. JC is 13 years old. Four months later, JC is alone, locked in the shed. She has been given a television previously to keep her company and has been watching shows on childcare to prepare for the baby. Philip also brought a video from the library about childbirth, which she also watched. One day in August, JC has been having pains all day, but didn't know what was happening. She didn't know she was in labor. JC is in pain, alone, and scared. About 5 p.m. that night, Nancy arrives to find JC in labor. Nancy, a nurse's aide, tries to help JC through the contractions. They last into the night, and at one point, Philip has to help to unwrap the umbilical cord from around the baby's neck. JC is in enormous pain, and without medication to help, she gives birth at 4.30 a.m. to a healthy baby girl. JC, now called Alyssa, and her daughter now both live in the one room. Days become routine with JC taking care of her daughter as best as she can and trying to make the room as nice as possible. Nancy and Philip have also been working on creating a secure hidden space so that JC and the toddler can finally go outside. They make sure the fence is built solidly and that the boards and other items cover any holes in the fence to keep the secret backyard hidden. Even so, JC is thrilled to be able to spend time outside in the sunshine and fresh air with her daughter. In 1998, at the age of 17, J.C. gives birth to her second daughter. She has now been held captive for almost seven years. Philip, still on parole for his rape conviction, has periodic visits from parole agents. Over the years that J.C. was hidden in the backyard, over 60 visits were made to the home. None of the agents ever ventured into the backyard. If they had, J.C. might have been rescued. Philip continued his obsession with very young girls. At a neighborhood barbecue, he attracted attention, calling out to the young girls and generally being creepy. One of the girls, curious about him, looked him up online and saw his status as a registered sex offender. As word got around the neighborhood about this, people started to pay more attention. One neighbor looked over the fence and saw tents in the backyard and small children. She called 911. An officer came out to investigate, but true to form, Garrido talked his way out of the situation, and the officer didn't even bother to get past the front door. He took Garrido's word that all was well and left. J.C., now 20 years old and raising two girls, had more freedom afforded to her. Especially after the Garridos started a printing business out of their home, doing small print jobs for individuals and businesses, J.C. helped as well even taking phone calls from customers and helping with orders. Some of their clients even saw J.C. and the girls, but thought nothing of it, just assuming J.C. was his wife and the two girls his daughters. At this point, J.C. had been under Garrido's control for almost a decade. She was completely dependent on him for her and now her kids' survival. It was pretty much guaranteed that she wouldn't try to get away, Because to do so, she would have to leave her children behind, which she would never do. And there didn't seem any way they could all escape. J.C. had come under the complete control of Garrido, and he knew it. Garrido also continued to become more vocal about his religious beliefs. He began telling his clients that he was called by God to save the world. He talked about hearing voices from God and angels and was very excited by his chosen status. He decided he needed to take his messages from God to a larger audience. His plan was to hold a rally at the UC Berkeley campus. He went to the campus police department to apply for a permit. No longer being afraid of being caught for the kidnapping, he even took the two little girls with him. An observant officer pegged Greedo as unstable at best and was concerned for the two little girls with him. They didn't seem to be acting like normal children. They were very quiet and not responsive when spoken to. After this meeting, the officer looked up his record and found his arrest and conviction for rape and kidnapping. 
She then contacted his parole agent, who informed her that no, Garrido didn't have any children. Her heart sank as she remembered the two little girls who looked like him and behaved so strangely. The parole agent called Garrido to meet with him, and incredibly, Garrido brought his entire family, including the girl he called Alyssa. Having got away with so much for so long, he must have believed he could talk his way out of this situation as well. When no one would answer the agent's questions about how everyone was related to his satisfaction, the parole agent called the police in for assistance. They then separated Alyssa from Garrido, Nancy, and the girls in order to question her. Only then, after 18 years of captivity, was she able to finally say, My name is J.C. Dugard. J.C. Dugard was found alive in Antioch. Excuse me. She was in good health, but living in a backyard for the past 18 years does take its toll. None of the children ever gone to school. They'd never been to a doctor. They were kept in complete isolation in this compound, if you will, at the rear of the house. J.C.'s mother, Terry, and the community supported her in her efforts to bring J.C. home for 18 long years were shocked and elated at finding out that J.C. was alive and well and coming home. J.C. was now 29 years old. Her oldest daughter was 15 years old and her youngest, 11, the same age J.C. was when her nightmare began. Nancy and Philip Grito were charged with 29 counts of kidnapping and rape. In 2011, they pled guilty. Philip received a sentence of 431 years in prison. Nancy was sentenced to 36 years to life. In 2011, J.C. Dugard's memoir about her kidnapping and her time held captive called A Stolen Life was released. She is raising her two daughters and is active in the JAYC Foundation, which provides support and services for families recovering from abduction and its aftermath. If you think you might have information about a missing child or to report child sexual exploitation, contact the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-THE-LOST. Or for tips on how to keep your children safe, visit their website at missingkids.org. Thanks for listening to this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. To give feedback or suggest show topics, you can find me on Facebook at Once Upon a Crime Pod and on Twitter at Upon a Crime. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes and rate and comment if you like it. Thanks for listening.